Wayne and I were 25 and less than six months in our marriage, and we'd been living on rice aroni for the last three. <coughs> with 500 bucks to our name, a truck loaded with his Vietnam War Air Force uniform, my hand-sewn wedding dress, and a couple of handmade fishing poles, we ditched the newly dubbed Silicon Valley. It was late spring, 1977, and I took to heart Canned Heat's lyrics in Going Up to the Country. <laughs> we were moving to Oregon. It was my idea. It'll be cheaper, greener. The people, they're friendly. <laughs> Eugene was kind of like OB, only with Douglas fir trees. <laughs> a ride plus to the ocean. It was more than trying out a new lifestyle. I was asking, who am I? After college, I didn't trust my hometown in the Bay Area. It seemed tied to the defense industry, fueling the Vietnam War. Mostly, though, I was lonely. I missed my good college friends. I missed hanging out. I miss sex. So when Dwayne came along and the veterans returning to college program where I tutored, I figured he was the one. He was from a small town and seemed down to earth. The truth, he was kind of lost. I determined we would find our way together. I was in a big hurry, a rush to get life all figured out. From the Eugene Rose Hotel, we phoned on rentals. The third morning, I circled an ad. Three-bedroom house on six acres, refrigerator, and stove. River Road area, 250 bucks a month. This was promising. Dwayne and I followed this middle-aged couple with heavy German accents into the backyard. I felt like I had tumbled into the technicolor world of Dorothy of Oz with the munchkins. Pink powdery plumes fanned off a dainty silk tree, nodding yellow daffodils, cherry trees sweet for eating, sour for pie making, rich riverbed dirt for gardening. I brought up to Oregon the two Bibles of the day, Foxfire and the Whole Earth Catalog. They told do-it-yourselfers the old ways to live off the land, how to make things. I made candles. I made soap, primed a pump, used a mall for splitting firewood for the wood stove. I was a regular Rosie the Riveter of the farm world. <laughs> Wayne and I picked up three piglets, raising our own meat, saving money, it was a good idea. In the late light, we were out in a field shed, clearing cobwebs and tossing out clods. We found a half-buried metal trough for the dry feet. We spread fresh, sweet straw to make a bed. Our three little pigs huddled together like little frightened puppies in the corner of the pen. But our landlords warned us, don't give them names. <laughs> In no time, maybe two months, they grew from little pink football-sized piglets to bigger than our dogs. They were on their way to becoming 300-pounders. Growing up, animals were pets, not meat. We had rabbits, dogs, and fish. In third grade, Charlotte's Web was my favorite. I loved Wilbur and his smart little friend, the wise spider, Charlotte. Pigs were my friends. But we'd been eating food out of boxes for months. By October, the Willamette Valley was living up to its reputation with cold driving rains, and so were the pigs. They stunk like pig poop and mud. A perfect equation equaling pig shit. I heard them all hours. They sounded like my brothers, only louder. They snorted, they farted, and squealed. They were non-stop eaters, pigs. And when they got into frenzied runs, they slipped. They rolled in their shit. <laughs> On a late November afternoon, I legged out the slop bucket filled with stale bread, some chicken bones, some leftover yogurt, 
The sound of the slop bucket hitting the feed trough would usually bring the pigs out of their pen. But where the hell did the pigs go? I dropped the bucket and spun around. If they escaped to the bottom of the property, the river would stop them. Could pigs swim in fast current? If they'd gone up the road, they could get hit. These pigs didn't have names. They were going to be meat. I ran down the dirt road in the blouse and skirt I'd sewn, pantyhose, sensible teacher's shoes, not exactly pig-chasing attire. <laughs> Under a tree, I could see two pinkish hides. But where was Big Red? Okay, we'd given one of them a name. <laughs> the biggest guy, with his now mahogany hide and strange red bristles. The two huddled maybe 50 feet in. I didn't think they saw or smelled me yet. They flicked their leathery ears, rooting around. I had a rope with me. I approached them slowly, trying to keep a steady eye on them in case they bolted. My foot sunk in a furrow. I was down in mud on hands and knees, and they saw me. One snorted and backed up. The other sniffed the air nonchalantly. These guys weren't little pink football size anymore. Think giant sized coolers, heavy, like they were full of ice cold ones. God damn it, I'm gonna be late! I'm gonna kill you! I pushed myself up, mud on skirt and shoes. I was determined not to let the native Oregonians living nearby <laughs> rally in defeat of the newcomer from the Golden State. <laughs> what about the rope? I tied a big slip knot. I'd lasso one, and the other might follow. On the first try, bullseye, it flew over its leafy ears and rested there. But then the pig backed up and shook its Teflon hide. Down slid the rope right past the slope of his non-existent neck. By now I'd lunged at the pig, hanging on its neck, grabbing the rope out of the mud. My head was just under the snarling teeth gnashing machine. Pig spit dripped on my cheek. Hooks were ripping my skirt. I landed face down with a mouth full of mud, spitting out grit. I pushed up. I wanted those pigs bad. They weren't cute anymore, and I was done worrying about a car hitting them. Hell, I wanted them dead. I winced at my blood cake torn pantyhose. The pigs had stopped running. I looked at my watch. They were getting the last laugh. I was late. Out on the road, I kicked a few rotting apples that had fallen off a neighbor's tree. I threw one back in their direction. One of them raised his head, air sniffing. The two stumbled stiffly out onto the road. Easy as pie. I led him back home. I was the pig whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> we posted flyers and asked neighbors on farms, had anyone found a pig? No one had heard anything. What I heard is snickering. I felt badly about it. One truth was that my life's desire had rooted itself in the Willamette riverbed soil of that six-acre farm. But another truth was that with the lost pig, the drafty wood stove, and jackets and boots with ode to pig shit, I had grown weary of dragging that slop bucket out to the pen. I missed having friends. I leaned on my husband for too much. I wanted him to finish college, read and discuss the merits of the transcendental life of being inspired by living close to nature. I wanted him to love the Oregon life. But none of the locals would give up their best fishing holes, and jobs went to those locals first. Duane was on the phone to his brother, making plans to work out of state with him. Just for a while, till we get caught up, I feared he was giving up. And I tried to be social, go out for a glass of wine with some women friends after work, but still in my teacher clothes. 
Then I'd have to leave before dark so I could get home for chores. I didn't open up to them about my double life, teacher by day, pig farmer by night. <laughs> they think I was strange. Somehow, the idea of finding a community of enlightened young people living a simpler life off the land hadn't panned out. A few weeks after the holidays, we went to the slaughterhouse. A woman in a white overcoat pointed to a pig chart and kept saying, pork chops and bacon come from the middle. <laughs> Thinking about how they would kill the pigs was brutal. We were told it would be done by a lethal injection of CO2, electrode shock, there'd be bloodletting, carcass stripping. I felt queasy and got back in the truck. Reality had set in. I wish we could change our minds, just keep them as pets. But the truth was, we couldn't afford pet pigs. One morning under needles of freezing rain, we picked up the slaughterhouse truck. Back home, we lowered the plank. The pigs scurried to the far corner of their pen and stood together, just the two of them now. I wondered if they could smell death. I had to go back to the house for heads of cabbage. We'd lure them up the ramp. No one saw my tears in the rain. Two months later, we got a call. Someone had heard someone talking in line at the grocery store about a pig they'd seen trampling gardens and breaking into someone's shed. <laughs> Was it? <laughs> then we got a call from a man who lived out on the floodplain for cresting rivers. If he'd seen our pig, it meant that Red had to have crossed a wide and swiftly flowing part of the river. We stood on the Black River bank, looking into the muddy torrent. No way. That night, I got out the world book. We learned a lot about pigs. <laughs> Big Red, wherever he was roaming, burning off layers of fat under his mahogany red hide, belonged to a the family of pigs that included cloven hoof beasts like deer and hippos. They're swift and they're smart. And when left in the wild, they could return to be like their boorish brothers, nocturnal and omnivorous. And yes, they were good swimmers. <laughs> I pictured Big Red sleeping by day, roving by night. He might be picking off small game, trashing gardens, smashing sheds. He probably did swim the Willamette. And I was secretly rooting for Big Red. He was the Nancy Whisper, <laughs> telling me when I was on my hands and knees to get up, brush off, keep going. He was my mascot for defying the odds. I'm still his biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy Perry.